afternoon. Uh, this is a paper on making the poverty line dependent on the reference group. This is some illustration. Uh, before I forget, let me mention that I have three co-authors, two people from the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata, Satya Chakravarti and Ashiketa Chattopadhyay, and a former student who's now teaching at Ariel University. Well, after Mariano's uh, talk, I don't have to convince you that uh, relative and absolute income uh, are important. And the purpose of, the pa of this paper is actually, you know, there is a similar distinction. You know, you have absolute poverty line usually in developing countries, and you have a relative poverty line in a uh, richer country. And after what we heard from Mariano, there is certainly a case for assuming that the poverty line should, be, should have both an absolute and a relative aspect. And what we do in this paper, uh, we derive axiomatically uh, a poverty line which will obey these two uh, assumptions. I will not go into many detail concerning the axiomatic derivation. I'll give you the, the intuition. Uh, before that, although Mariano talked about reference group, I'll give you some survey of recent work on the importance of reference group. And then, at the, then I'll do this uh, axiomatic presentation, and at the end I'll give you some res result of our empirical application. <coughs> okay. Now, as, it's, as it appears here, certainly choosing a poverty line has a lot of impact from a policy point of view. As you know, the World Bank in 1991, following some work by Martin Ravalion and that in Van der Valle, uh, had fixed the poverty line, an absolute poverty line of one dollar. And later on, a few years later, other work by Martin Ravalion, Shen, and Sangrola uh, decided that the poverty line, uh, absolute poverty line, should be one dollar twenty-five. Just to say a few words for those who are not familiar with these papers, uh, how did they get to one dollar or dollar twenty-five? Very simple. They took the national poverty line in various countries, uh, relatively poor countries, obviously using a purchasing power parity exchange rate, that they regressed on the log of per capita expenditure. And what happened, they got a line which was a regression line, if you want, a kind of, which was flat up to some level of per capita expenditure, and then it was rising. So at the point, you know, where it was flat, that gave uh, them the, the idea that this should be the poverty line. So it used to be $1, then it's $1.25. Though there's, a, there's been some criticism, serious criticism, of uh, the approach. You can read it in uh, Angus Deaton's uh, presidential address to the American Economic Association in 2010, and uh, where he gives a lot of example which show that it, it is, this approach is somehow problematic. He made some proposal, but I do not have time to go into details. So, as I said before, we want to take, a, a, the, take the idea that a poverty line should have some absolute as well as some relative aspect. And the way we do this, and you will see it when uh, go a little bit into the demonstration, is that we actually we compare two situations. Okay, let's assume we have an individual who is just at the poverty line, whatever the poverty line is, and he doesn't take into account other people's income. So he has some utility which he derives from his absolute income, which is a poverty line. And we compare this situation with another case where we assume the individual is again at the poverty line, but is also influenced by some reference income. And we will assume that in the both case, the level of utility is the same, and we will derive, uh, as a consequence, a way to define the poverty line. So that's your general idea, and you will see the details uh, later on. Now, as was mentioned before, we, the importance of relative income is, is a relatively old, old tradition. Uh, Mariano mentioned the famous citation by Karl Marx on the houses, a work by Duesenberry. Uh, yes, yeah, there is also a long, uh, relatively long uh, 
literature more, you know, centered more on the idea of relative deprivation. It started with the prosperity work of Renziman on deprivation in 66, and then you have several other papers which uh, took, uh, you know, which extended in a certain way the early work of Renziman. Okay, so uh, let me just say a few words for a few minutes on the idea of reference uh, group because uh, it is, you know, one of the key aspects of our, of our approach. Now, uh, some of the ideas that I will mention quickly now have been already mentioned previously. So there are several ways of uh, defining a reference group. The first, uh, one possibility is to consider as reference group people who, you know, who, uh, um, uh, who work with you or something like this, you know, and, uh, and, and you, in the paper by Claudia Senik in 2009, you have this kind of, of approach. Uh, Clark and Andrew Clark and Oswald defined the reference group of a worker as the income of employees who had the same age and level of qualification as a worker and were doing the same kind of job. Other st uh, studies looked more at the characteristic, okay, and uh, interesting work by Ada Ferreri Carbonell, where uh, the reference group is people who have your, your age, your level of education, your region of residence, a little bit similar to what Mariona presented previously. Some other uh, people define a reference group or reference income as the average income of individuals of the same race in the cluster and district where the individuals surveyed live. This is a paper by Kingdon and Knight. Now, as far as the direction of uh, influence, you know, how do, do other people's income influence me? Well, usually the emphasis is on status, which, as was mentioned previously by Mayan, if, other pe if my reference group income increases, then I will feel uh, not so good as before. And this is mentioned in and empirically tested in several papers by Claudia, by, Sin, by Claudia Sinek 2001, Clark and Sinek. But I want to talk about another effect, which until recently was really uh, only theoretically uh, presented but with no testing. It is an idea which goes back to a famous paper by the late Albert O. Hirschman, who is in a technical appendix by Michael Rothschild, uh, as a story is as follows. Albert O. Hirschman would be teaching in several universities over his life career, was, was teaching, was working at uh, Harvard, and he got stuck in a tunnel in Boston. So there were two lines that were stuck, and suddenly the line next to him was moving, and his line was not moving. And he says he didn't feel bad, because his idea was, if this line is moving, I will soon also move. And so he, fe he felt good about it. And that gave him the idea of the tunnel effect. What is the idea? That when other people's income increases, well, you may eventually expect that your own income will increase. And this is a signaling effect. So that was a nice idea, which was not tested, but it was recently, well, a few years ago, tested by Claudia Senik in two papers. And there is some evidence that this effect exists also. Obviously, the status effect is important, but this exists also. Uh, some more, uh, a few additional work which you have on the parallel impact of your own income and the rise in reference income, like in the previous paper we had. For example, Knight and, and Corser looked at subjective well-being in China, and in the regression they introduced a dummy variable indicating whether the household income was much above, above, below, much below the village average. And Andrew Clark and co-author reported a regression where the dependent variable refers to the satisfaction with income, and the result is interesting, and to compare with your finding, Mariano, it then appears that the coefficient of own income is about three times as high as that of self-reported reference income, and of opposite sign, obviously, even when a variable measuring the comparison intensity of the individual, that is, how important it is for the respondent to compare her income with that of other, is interesting. So this was really just to uh, show you that there is a rising uh, literature stressing the importance of reference income. And in a recent paper, Bernard Van Praag 
uh, you know, st uh, you know, tr try to to convince people that it is very important to collect information on references. Okay, so let's now present a little bit of a formal framework. We will have actually an additive and a multi multiplicative form, and this idea appears already in the paper by Clark and Oswald. Our idea is that the individual utility is increasing and concave in absolute income, but it is decreasing and convex in the reference income. Okay, I gave you already before the, the general idea that we compare two situations when one when my utility depends only on my own income, the absolute approach if you want, and one where my utility depends also on other people's income. Now what is interesting is that we prove that whether you take a multiplicative or additive form, which means you know, we can assume that what's important is the absolute gap in dollar between my reference income and my income, or you can assume that what's important as far as reference income is, is a ratio between the reference income and my income. What's interesting, whatever you assume, two possibilities, obviously we are not, it's not the same demonstration and even not the same axiom, but we always get the result that a new poverty line taking into account both the absolute and the relative income becomes a weighted average of the given poverty line, the absolute poverty line and the reference income, and we can give a nice interpretation to the weights. What is also attractive is that in fact the results we get, we can show that it corresponds by, sh by choosing correctly the weight to, for example, if we take the EU standard where the, the, uh, where the, the weight is 60% uh, uh, of, the, of, the <laughs> of the median income or the mean income, and we'll see in a second, just don't remember right now, or a proposal made by Tony Atkinson and Francois Bourguignon in 2001, we can show that these are particular case of the result we did. All right, so a little bit of mathematics without going into too many details. Let X and M be respectively the absolute income and the reference income of an individual. We can call M this reference income as a kind of positional good if you want. M could be the mean, the median income, or whatever you you know, you consider reference income, and we assume utility x of n, which is, it increases in x, but it in the concave, it is concave in x, but it decreases in m, other things concerned, it is convex in m, all right? These are quite a standard assumption. What's the idea, why do you have this convexity and this negative income in m? Not only when the reference income increases, my income doesn't change, I will feel worse, but when it e increases even more, you know, I will consider that it becomes more and more difficult to reach this income, and that's why you have this convexity. All right, so let's first, the first case is when I assume that the way I look at the reference income is by looking at the difference in dollar term between the reference income M and my income. So a utility function like this, sorry, a utility function like this, my utility depends on my income as well as the gap between my income and the reference income because the reference income is higher than my income, uh, you know, because we focus on poverty here. Obviously, this is going to be negative. Now, what axiom do we propose? Two axioms, very simple. The first one is we have called linear translatability, and it says the following things. If you add the same amount in dollar to my income and to the reference income, then my utility following this increase in, in the income of the reference individual and, and my income, my utility will increase by some percentage, by some share K of this additional income, okay? So the idea is that since under equal increase of the absolute and reference income, the relative status remains the same because x minus m didn't change. x plus c minus m plus c doesn't change. But my income increased, so individual utility should increase. And this axiom assumes that but utility doesn't increase necessarily by the full amount, but by some percentage. The second axiom is linear homogeneity. 
which says that if you multiply my income and the reference income by some constant c, then uh, the utility will be multiplied by some constant c. And then we prove that given these two axioms, I don't enter into the proof. Actually, I would not be able because I'm not a specialist of axiomatic. This is the field of two of my co-authors, those who work at the Indian Statistical Institute. Then you can prove that the utility is written as a weighted average of my own income and the reference income with the constant A being negative. And actually, it corresponds somehow to the, an idea which was already put forth in 98 by Clark and Oswald, the idea of additive comparison model. Now, how do we get our results? Now, we'll assume a situation where I do not take into account other people's income, so I only take into account my own income, and let's assume my own income is on the poverty line. Then I just... If I take into account other people's income, I will get this level of utility. If I do not take other people's income into account, I will have this utility. And then when I equalize both utility, I end up, it's easy to show, I'm not gonna, that my, the, the new poverty line should be a weighted average of my original poverty line when, I, when you have only an absolute poverty line and the reference income and the, the weight can be easily computed. Obviously, the higher this weight Q, the more weight I give to absolute income, and that's why it can be considered, obviously, as a policy parameter that policymaker can choose. Let's go quickly to the other possibility, what Clark and Oswald call the ratio comparison model, which means that you, look, you take into account the reference income by comparing, by looking at the ratio of your income and the reference income. So we write, the utility function in this way, the utility function of the function of my income and of some function of this ratio, and you do the same procedure. You compare a situation where I ignore the reference income and a situation where I do take into account. In both cases, you assume you are either poverty line, the poverty line when you Z0 when you have only an absolute approach, and the poverty line Z1 when you have take a relative approach. The axiom we make are the axiom, the following axiom, linear homogeneity, which says that if you multiply the income and the reference income by a constant C, then your utility will be multiplied by constant C. When you have two other assumptions, which are more technical assumptions, normalization, continuity, and we do the same kind of demonstration as before, we equalize the utility in both cases, okay? So this is a case where I do not take into account the reference income, or I say that the reference income is my own income, I am at the poverty line Z0, and the other case, and you can prove that at the end, the poverty line, which will not be the same as in the case of the additive model, but the poverty line again, when you have a reference income, will be a weighted average of the poverty line which you assume when you have only a an absolute poverty line, and the reference income. All right. So, and here you have the formulation, you know, where the European uh, Union assumes that the poverty line is 60% of the median. Here you have the weight that you should take if you want to get the EU poverty line. And Atkinson and Bourguignon made another suggestion, and here you have the weight to get the Atkinson-Bourguignon uh, poverty line. All right, a few minutes, a few words of uh, empirical application. We worked with uh, Asian data in various countries. We assumed that the reference income by lack of information was either the median or the mean. And we assume, you know, we applied our results that the, po the poverty line taking into account both absolute and relative income should be a weighted average of the absolute poverty line and the reference income. And we call this kind of poverty line an amalgam poverty line. As weight, weight of the absolute income, we chose one, which is the situation you have today when you take a dollar or dollar twenty-five as poverty line in developing countries. But we also try to find out what would be the impact of, on poverty if the weight is 90%, 66%, or 5%. Now, the data we had included only information on the D side, so we had only 10 
10 income, you know, the distribution of income in various countries had only 10 data, but we extended this by trying, by applying two techniques, one which was proposed a long time ago in 73 by Nana Kakwani and Ripesh Poder, which is a, a regression where you regress the height of the Lorentz curve on the cumulative population a share, and another which is a technique which was proposed at WIDER by Tony Shorks when he was the head of WIDER and Wang Wang Wan when he was working at WIDER. And I do not have time to enter into this technique, but it allows you to create a lot of observation on the ba basis of 10 observations. So let me just give you two, three minutes. You know, what it will be the impact on the percentage of poor and also on the number of poor when you adopt our proposal. So if I, we just, I give you results just on some country, like Bangladesh, for example, the absolute poverty line, assuming $38, which is uh, $1.25, then a day, then you have 43% of poor. So that's actually, now, if you took the amalgam poverty line that we proposed, you can ha you have uh, a quite an, an increase uh, a little bit less than 10% in the number of poor. If you go from 100 to 50%, in Cambodia you have a much greater increase. This is when you do the weighting with respect to the median, but we have also res a result when we take it with respect to the mean. Obviously, because usually the median is smaller than the mean, you're going to have a higher impact on poverty. If you take China, here's the difference between rural and and urban China. Here, the impact is very important. With, with the traditional absolute poverty line of $38, and assuming the reference income is a median, then if instead of giving all the weight to the absolute poverty line, you give it only a 50% weight, you're going to have a tremendous increase in percentage of poor from 29 to 40% with the kakwani Poder approach, 21 to 36% with the Sharks and one approach. And in urban area, you didn't have any poor in 2009 with the absolute poverty line, and you have 26 or 21 percent. Uh, and similarly with the, the mean, we have also data on India. In India, the jump is somewhat less important in the rural area from 66 to 42 or 34 to 42. In urban, you have a bigger impact, all right? And you have other results you can look at since the paper is on the website. So with this, let me just conclude that this is the, the first time a proposal has been made to axiomatically derive a poverty line which will depend both on absolute income and on a reference income. And we have shown, I didn't show you uh, this table, you can take a look. I, we also computed the impact as far as the number of poor is. And in some cases, you have a tremendous impact. Let me just, oh, sorry. Uh, if you take the case of China, for example, rural China, sorry, I don't have it here. Okay, ah, here it is, sorry. Rural China, you can see that the number of poor increases from 142 million to uh, 251 when you take the median as reference income. You can take a look at the other. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh,